Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at at The Block, and I'm very excited for today's episode. Joining us on the other side of the mic are our two guests. We have Stani from Lens joining us, of course, and Variance Legion. These two are probably at the epicenter of all things things Web3, and I'm very excited to have them both. This is not their first time joining us, so you should remember them. We've been exploring all things Web3 social here at The Block, experimenting across the Lens ecosystem, and we couldn't think of two perfect guests to help dissect everything that's happening in Web3 social and the development's shaping social broadly, right? I mean, given the backdrop of everything that Elon Musk has done at Twitter, or I guess we're calling it X now, and threads. Not a big fan of the threads. Not a big fan. Um, I, I think I used it for, you know, 30 minutes. I was a bit, you know, sh- I didn't want to I didn't want to be left behind in the proverbial dust. So I clicked the button to move my account from Instagram over, but wasn't impressed. Anyway, maybe we can start there. When you when you think about the landscape, these two platforms, everyone's trying to usurp Twitter in some way or, or the other. Um, and, and they're not the only ones, right? We have um, our former president on True Social pontificating all the time. What do you make of the environment right now? What are they getting wrong? What are they getting right? And how do they open the door for Web3 Social? Maybe we can start with you, Stani. Yeah, maybe. Um, uh, first of all, it's happy to, happy to be here, uh, Frank. And um, Thanks. I think last time we met, you were here in London. Uh, we met in my local pub. We had a pint, we had a couple of pints, and we were discussing all things for three. So it's nice to be here also um, on air um, and talk about this thing. So I, we're just basically taking that conversation and forcing it and, and having Lee sort of add a bit more of um, decorum to <laughs> it. Uh, it's amazing. That, it's amazing. It's going to be interesting because, um, especially Lee has a lot of interesting kind of like um, takes on Web3 social and, and something that I uh, try to reflect quite a lot in, in my work as well. And um, just to say briefly, I think the landscape now is um, very interesting. I, I think we are very conscious about social media today as, as everyday users. We start to understand that you know, we want to reshape a bit the internet um, and the way we actually engage and what kind of information is is given to us um, and how it's valued. And also, we really want to have a lot of um, ownership as well. And by ownership, I mean is more about self-sovereignty um, in the sense that we want things that we create um, and build um, be also something that um, we can actually own as well. And I think that one interesting thing about even without Web3 Social is that there's now more user user optionality and choice. And this is why yeah. we see a lot of interesting um, kind of like a Twitter clones happening with the threads. Um, but it definitely isn't the exact right infrastructure yet um, compared to what, what is happening now with Web3 Social and what are the uh, potential there. Uh, I think uh, Lee has even more points on, on, on that too. I'm, I mean, I don't know how Lee has the time to write everything that she does. She's, I, how are you so prolific? It oh, doesn't make sense. <laughs> I, I feel like I don't write enough, to be honest. So I'm, I'm always trying to squeeze out more time to write, but that's really kind of you. So maybe how can you exp- um, expand upon that? Yeah. Sure, definitely. Yeah, first of all, it's really nice to be here. Thanks for having me, Frank, and great to see you, Stani. Um, I think when talking about Web3 Social, it's it's really critical to remember that Web3 Social doesn't exist mm. in a silo. It's not its own universe. The fact is that every consumer application is competing against all of the other consumer applications out there for people's time. And so Web3 Social needs to be taken in a context where there's all this activity happening around social media platforms in general, including in the Web2 world. And so, you know, what is that context? I think for the past 
10, 15 years, we've basically had the same social networking platforms that we all still mm-hmm. use now, which are the big, you know, the, the major platforms of Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, well, more recently, TikTok, but the landscape has basically remained unchanged since, you know, 10 years ago. And I think we're finally reaching this dawning realization among their users that they're ready for something new. They've experienced a lot of the changes and the turbulence associated with those platforms over the past few years with management yeah. changes, algorithm changes. They've seen a lot of their favorite creators getting deplatformed or journalists getting deplatformed or their content moderation policies changing. And so I think we're we're at this historic level of like user readiness for something new, a new paradigm of social networking. And the question mark is like what comes next? And I think there's now a bunch of new entrants that are very exciting that are coming up, um, including Web3 social networks, which I'm personally, I think we're all very excited about, as well as a number of like new Web2 entrants like Threads who are trying to compete for that user attention and, and user readiness. Yeah. Um, in terms of your question of like, what are the learnings from what's going on right now and, and Threads and what's happening with Twitter? I think there's a lot of learnings um, and I, we could probably discuss this for an entire episode, so I'll just keep it short. I think the major learnings that I've seen, um, particularly from the launch of threads is that um, like social connections and your follower graph and your social network is extremely context dependent. You can't just take your network on Instagram, build a, a written social network on top of it and expect that to resonate the same way that your Twitter followers and following that you've pruned for years, that content resonates with you. It's, it's just not the same context of sharing. hundred um, percent. So I actually had a hundred percent. Yeah. I wrote, I wrote a post on, on threads about this. It was my second ever post on threads. I was like, I realized that the really attractive people that I follow on Instagram are actually very unhinged in writing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And hundred <laughs> percent. And so who you want to follow depending on the content format actually differs. Um, and I think the second major learning is like, it is possible to, to roll out a social network too quickly and for yeah. it to grow too fast or to make changes too quickly. Yes, completely. Social networks are so fragile you have a very brief window of user attention where they're willing to give you a shot. And if they don't have a great experience in those first, like, let's say one or two times, they're very much not apt to come back because, again, you're competing against like so many entertaining options. And so what we've seen from like the the growth chart of threads is that it peaked at like 100 million users. And then I think retention and engagement and time spent has collapsed dramatically And so what that tells me is like, even though it had the distribution advantage of all of these Instagram users, it needed to figure out the algorithm and the discovery really, really quickly to be able to support those floodgates opening. And it wasn't there from the beginning. And so they probably should have rolled it out more slowly. Yeah, but it's like you need need both, right? Uh, For some, they might have that the better sort of algorithm capabilities, but they don't have that distribution. But I want to double click on something you said that I thought was incredibly salient, which is you can't really just port over from one social media uh, experience. Um, you can't port that over to another social media um, environment. And we had a um, uh, member of our team who would bang on the tables about taking everything we were doing on Twitter and porting it over to Instagram because we do really well on Twitter as a company. And I would make that the same exact point that you made, Lee, which is it's not that simple. What works on one, if anything, almost does the opposite on the other. It almost, it doesn't compel audiences. It almost, you know, pushes them away. Um, So kind of thinking about that in the lens of, no pun intended, um, threads and and what what Elon's doing in in what way are they being pushed away that presents an opportunity to Web three social specifically I mean we can use just Elon's personality as an example to your point Lee we've never been in a time or a point in time where people are just so ready or fed up 
for whatever reason, to do something else. So how does Web3 Social strike while the iron's hot? Well, I could say yeah. maybe, uh, I know, Lee, you oh, want to go first? Go ahead, Stanny. No, Stanny, go first. You go first. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I get, I'm happy to go first. Go yeah, you go first. Um, yeah, so I think there's, there's two forces that are really propelling Web3 Social forward right now. Um, like two opportunities that are being presented. One is that like the existing social networks are in upheaval and people are really fed up with them. Um, I think, you know, there's been a lot of analyses written about Twitter and the fact that the algorithm just is not the same as it was, how it has basically destroyed its like its core um, interest graph by tweaking the algorithm to favor like content from people that you don't interest know. graph. So explain that maybe to a interest graph to someone who is a, a, a novice. Yeah. And an interest graph is basically um, a concept in social networking, which is the idea that people all have different interests and, and you should connect people to the others, other people in the network who share your same interests and to be able to surface content that appeals to their interests. And so Twitter's Twitter was based off of broken that an interest graph that users had sort of pruned um, painstakingly by cultivating their followers and followings um, where over years, you know, personally, like I followed people, unfollowed people to prune that interest graph perfectly so that mm -hmm. I would see a really interesting feed when I went to Twitter. And all of a sudden, Elon tore that up by saying that if you don't subscribe to Twitter blue, your posts aren't going to be prioritized. If you, um, he, he rate limited people, um, and he got, mm -hmm. you know, he, he just like completely smashed the, the original algorithm as it was the original interest graph and replaced it with something new. And so a lot of people aren't seeing very interesting content as before. And so that's one opportunity is the fact that like people are looking for, where can I see interesting content? Um, people are, are finally kind of being pulled away from their existing social networks that they had been using before and open to trying something new because they're worse than before. That's opportunity number one. I think the second opportunity around Web3 Social is like around offering a completely new value proposition to users that wasn't available before in the context of social networks. Um, and I think a lot of people, um, well, actually, I don't know if a lot of people, but like I have this theory that new social networks tend to arise with um, new, like new content types that get supported or new social graphs that get created. So new content types is like you move from text to photo to video and each of one of them corresponds to a new social network. New social graphs are like you, you form new connections between people and those new graphs are all correlated with a different social network. Like Facebook was the friend graph, the real world friend graph. TikTok is the video interest graph. Um, and so where does Web3 fit into all of this? You could say that maybe a new type of graph that is waiting to get created is a socioeconomic graph. It's different from the purely social graphs that we had had before where people just had relationships with each other and knew each other from high school or college. But instead, in Web3, they could be actually linked by economic interests, things that they do on chain. So what does that mean? I'll be, my feed will just be all my fellow poors <laughs> or something else? I mean, I think that is one implementation possibly of it is ascertaining like your kind of net worth based on on-chain behaviors and, and putting you together with people who are similar. But I don't know if that's very interesting. You guys to are going to be having so much fun. <laughs> In, in your interest graph, I'm going to be right. over here. I think the more interesting version is like we have so much on-chain data around who is interested in what communities based on not just like smashing a like button, but based on things that you actually do on-chain, transactions that you've done on-chain with skin in the game. So how's that playing out? How's that playing out on Lens right now? Not to interrupt, but I, I just find well, it's this so interesting. very fascinating because um, in, in some ways, what I see uh, in, in the same way that um, Ethereum as a interest graph as well in a in a in a social network basically like mm -hmm. what what Lens does it it provides different kinds of guarantees and structures in, in a form of a protocol um, things like identity 
uh, networking, following different profiles and creating content, mm -hmm. storing that content in the form of tokenized NFTs, for example. And what Lee said is very fascinating because this kind of social behavior happens in Web3 on an ongoing basis. Um, and it has an economical perspective, but also that social perspective. It's a social event. So, for example, when users were minting uh, CryptoKitties uh, a few years ago, that was a social event. When people were buying NFTs during the NFT summer or uh, aping into protocols during DeFi summer, uh, those were all social events. And even more recently, you see sub-social events, like, for example, people collecting music NFTs um, or supporting um, Gitcoin grants and, 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 and so forth. So in terms of lens, what we see um, as the behavior is that um, how do you consume content? So, so for example, is content only consumable in a physical form? Um, and today, for example, we consume content also di digitally in terms of streaming or buying uh, digital content. But what makes it even more interesting is that um, on-chain data, and, and especially, for example, in Lens, you have that verification from on-chain of how people are actually consuming. And it's fascinating because um, a lot of the things we actually uh, do um, is based on how we actually spend time or other resources as, for example, money, for example. If you buy a vinyl record, chances are that you belong to a group that listens to the same type of music and you ha and it acts as a kind of a, um, what Lee said, skin in the game. It's, it's, it's a high, highest signal you can give for uh, an artist or a creator or to a network by actually contributing with value. And I think that's fascinating. And in terms of lens, the kind of like a, you have the ability to collect content as NFTs, pay to follow different users, and you have this built-in monetization layer. But for me, what's fascinating is that it really opens the design space of new kind of uh, uh, backing of creators and consumption, consumption of the digital goods that they create and internet artifacts um, as well. So if, if there is an interesting article, someone writes, maybe the reason that I will collect that article um, is because I want more content from that uh, creator. I want to read more or I want to I wanna basically back this person because somehow I want to see more content and, and consume and, and create more value that is relevant for me. If I, I do, I'm, I am curious, um, you know, we're kind of injecting this financial element to social media. I'm curious regarding the asset first approach. What, what are the potential challenges and risks associated with maybe creating financial incentives within Web3 social? How can networks strike a balance between appealing to folks who, you know, are are, are mercenaries and, and folks and, and maintaining high quality and avoiding spam forms of manipulation? Yeah. How do you think through that? First, can I say something on the previous point of socioeconomic networks? Yes, you can. Okay, great. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think another another interesting framing of the social, like of, of the history of social networks, is that with increasing internet bandwidth, we get additional types of social networks that support that bandwidth, that create content that is, you know, sort of in accord with that level of bandwidth. And so the original social networks were basically just simple text blogging platforms like Zanga and LiveJournal. And then we got photos and people were able to, you know, upload and download photos. And so then we got photo sharing sites, Facebook from this era, Tumblr too, um, and, and then video, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the interesting thing about Web3 is that maybe there's a new type of bandwidth, which is economic bandwidth. There's financial information that's inherent to every action that people take on chain. And like Stanley said, um, being able to actually put value behind something, behind a creator or a piece of content or whatever it might be, it's the highest form of vouching for something, displaying that you like something to actually have skin in the game. It's so much more meaningful than perhaps just taking an action on a like button. And so that concept of this 
economic bandwidth that blockchains now afford us, I think could be an interesting substrate for a new social network. Um, and that I think tees up well to your next question of like, what are, what are the downsides of building with this economic component in mind of taking an asset first approach that leans into the economic element of blockchains and enables people to be able to profit? Well, I think the downsides are essentially the same ones that we've seen play out during this last um, cycle of crypto, which is that you get a lot of unsustainable usage of networks driven by speculation, people who try out new products without really any intrinsic desire to stay a part of the network or to be a valuable member of the network on an enduring basis, but who instead try something out or take very low value options just in order to gain some sort of financial value. Um, and I think that's the, that's the risk that you run with asset first approaches to web three social as well as people think that maybe there's a way for them to earn and that kind of overshadows all of the other interests that they might have in a particular social network but i don't think this this problem is like inherent or um it's unsolvable i think there's a lot of people who just dismiss crypto entirely because it has been in part speculative to date and my response to that is it's not it's not a category error for crypto to be financial in nature. I think there's been implementation errors with how the asset first approach has been taken so far, um, where speculators are very much like a huge part of the user base of some of these networks. But I don't think that's sure. that's necessary um, yeah. per se. I think things can be done to mitigate that. Well, it's I a, want to say something yeah, go ahead, Stani, yeah. interesting as well. Yeah, because I think that the, the amount of transparency – Web3 has is just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we are looking at all this transactioning that is happening on a public uh, networks, it's it's actually like th that increases awareness and also uh, ability to see those different kinds of opportunities and how these systems that we built and design are working actually and how to make them better. But what is fascinating is that uh, for for me th the way I see it is that we do have this very um, large financial element on the existing networks. Mm -hmm. But as a user, we don't really see it because we're kind of, uh, um, we, we're participating in all of these internet businesses um, and internet businesses by, I mean, social media networks that are built in, in during the Web2 um, boom. And we don't really see how the actual monetization works there. So for example, if these networks were more transparent and they will actually show to the users that, hey, we actually made um, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, because you're in our platform and here's how we make money. And um, like if they will be transparently showing that actually how much money they're making, um, you'll be in the exact same uh, situation. Um, but with Web3, what it can actually do is it brings that transparency, um, also easier ways to share that um, that kind of an upside across the whole network. So not only uh, by let's say an, uh, 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 the the creator itself, but the creator can share between the algorithms, the experiences that are created to surface and make the content look good, uh, the protocol itself, and anything that is part of that uh, so-called content supply chain. And at that point, you can actually, and this is happening even today on Lens because the creators, they're sharing um, the NFT collect fees with uh, other users that are amplifying the content by mirroring it to other users or whoever was part of the creation process. They also split the, uh, the revenue. And, and that's a sign that people actually want to share revenue uh, and make it as an equal a sum uh, game that benefits all. And I think if um, if we, we take that kind of like an approach and we, we will see that actually that how different users are actually making revenue for the platform, we will be quite shocked that, that why users aren't getting any of that uh, benefit. And they can't really because the everything that users are doing on the platform, they really are giving the ownership for the platform. And we saw that recently, for example, that if you can take a username out of one user and give it to you know, someone else, um, remove followers, block from the platform. Those are the kind of things that are very 
it doesn't happen frequently, but are like kind of like a reminders of where things could actually go. But it's a bigger reminder that when you do not actually own, if you are living on this um, rented internet space, mm-hmm. um, and even if you are getting rent free, you are actually paying in paying that with other ways. And I think that's the kind of like approach where uh, the asset perspective comes. Like, what if this actually we have an asset approach which is transparent and actually can benefit the the, the end users on the background while they're getting these amazing experiences and uh, using the algorithms and have actual choice to choose what they want to consume. So that helps mitigate some of that downside. It's interesting to juxtapose it with monetization efforts that are underway on different platforms like Twitter. How would you um, think about the differences betwixt the twain? Yeah, I, I'm happy to take a stab at this because I've been sort of looking at the space of creator monetization for a really, really long time. Um, the way that I see it is um, a lot of the social networking platforms have made various attempts to be more creator friendly over the years. They've introduced creator funds. Um, they are doing things like ad sharing. I think Elon announced that creators who get over 15 million views per month would be able to participate in ad sharing from the platform. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, miss it I, by this much, Lay. List it, miss it by this much. <laughs> I know, all thanks to those algorithm changes. Um, At the end of the day, I always come back to who has the leverage, who has the power, who is able to dictate these policies, and how much power does a creator have versus how much power does the platform have. And while I applaud any sort of movement that the platforms do in terms of being more creator-friendly from an economics perspective, at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. they can decide, you know, on a a whim to, to roll back that change and to change it, to, you know, like yeah. alter the program, to change the payout rates, whatever. We've seen that happen so many times in, in the past few years where payout rates change or programs get deprecated and creators are just left out in the cold. Whereas in the Web3 world, I think what Stani is building, what Lens Protocol offers, what Web3 Asset for Social Networks offer is this ability for creators to be able to determine for themselves what are the prices that I want to charge? How do I want to monetize? What is the business model that I want to seek as a creator? How much do I want to split revenue with people who mirror my posts? That's basically like the lens version of a a repost. Um, And so every element of the business model is totally in the creator's control. I think that's the inherent difference. I just like the idea of um, building on a shared network in, in the way that you can actually, as a um, let's say a developer or um, an entrepreneur that wants to, you know, as a founder that wants to to build a social application. So the steps to to, to make a successful application, there's a lot of steps, and and one of them includes to create creating a strong network um, and also appealing experiences. That's something that really kicks that dopamine uh, rush for users, and being already being able to ex- tap into existing network, that also means that you actually have less of a concern of building a network and you can shift focus on actually and resources to um, building that experience that is that is exciting. So like I've seen this with Lens because with Lens we built um, pretty much, you know, protocol um, only. There was this big discussion like protocol first, app first, um, and I think we actually went something in the middle where we went with protocol only. So we built the protocol and we saw community members building different kinds of um, mm-hmm. desktop interfaces that are open source that can be forked, uh, read on mobile um, clients as well, and just integrating um, Lens even to existing Web3 applications and adding a social layer uh, into it. And what we noticed is that um, after we saw a lot of this um, building happening, a lot of the build was actually um, building something similar that already existed. So uh, the Twitters, the Instagrams, uh, the Pinterest of the world. And slowly we started to see that as, as the kind of like a base content is there and the base community excitement is there, the, the kind of a level up started to happen. So we, we are starting to see a bit more 
uh, a bit novel use cases with um, Web3 based, for example, fashion, uh, a bit more gaming uh, like ex- uh, social experiences. And, and a lot of designers even recently are excited to think about like how we create new experiences uh, on Lens and are tapping in to build something. So I think uh, I, I think we're in a very happy place when we actually start to see that we see frequently new interesting um, apps being built with social experiences on top of a decentralized Web3 uh, infrastructure that has all those elements that are empowering the users and the users can actually then choose what are those networks because uh, frankly speaking i'm personally tired for of of all the social media networks that we have today they haven't really changed a lot since um uh, a, a decade now and and the changes that are made um they're still the same experiences but what we actually could build if it will be easier could be something completely new i actually I'm more excited about experience, social experiences within games like Fortnite than what social media is today with, with big tech. Yeah, you hit the hammer on the nail in terms of the, the, the types of changes. I, do you guys remember when Instagram first changed the feed and made it non-chronological and everyone had an aneurysm? You know, uh, I mean, I mean, that was a very traumatic experience for everyone. And you know, people, I think, out there in the world may not understand or appreciate this economic element that you eloquently unpack there, Lee, but they could definitely relate to the power of a community and having a say in changes being made. Uh, imagine if, you know, I don't know what it was. Was it like five years ago, six years ago, two years ago? I don't know. But imagine if all three of us could have, like, participate in some way. We had some stake in the game, not just from a monetization perspective, but from an actual product perspective. No one wanted it. Like, no, like you couldn't find a person. And then the head of product at Instagram, like, did that really cringe video. Um, it, the, the memories are coming back to me. But, I mean, that's something that can, um, I think, really resonate um, yeah. with people. Totally. I, I think, like, Yeah, I I think that element of user choice that is afforded by building on a shared foundation through an open protocol is really powerful. And we're only starting to see what that means for users. Like, as a user of Lens Protocol, if I don't use, if I don't like one application or one application has an algorithm that, you know, does something that I'm not happy with, I can switch over to another Lens application that is built on top of the protocol and, and take all of my content, my followers, my following with me. Um, and that's such a paradigm shift versus the yeah. social networks that we're familiar with. It is. And yeah, I, I wrote, yeah, I wrote this piece about like the asset first approach to, to web three social versus the ideological mm-hmm. first approach to web three social. And I think the way that I would summarize all of these different arguments that we've sort of been teasing out is like one appeals to the upside of users want to profit, they want to earn from their activity. That's the asset first approach. There's this new economic element that can be harnessed. And the other approach sort of appeals to the downside, the downside case of what can happen when you don't have, um, you know, an open social networking platform, um, one that is closed off instead. And, And the downside case is like, you don't have ownership over things like your content or your profile or your handle. Um, you don't have any say over the algorithm changes or the product changes. And so I think the two approaches are kind of like psychologically appealing to either the upside or the downside that is in users' minds. But to play devil's advocate to an extent, I think some folks who might be listening and uh, listening to that sort of description might think, well, could that be a bit chaotic? Am I Is the future of Web3 Social just me bouncing around from platform to platform until I find my niche? Well, you know, there's something nice about, to an extent, um, audiences sort of galvanizing around a few select uh, companies because, you know, everyone's there. Like, if I'm I, – I may have the ease with which I can – drag around my following um, or, or rather my content or my my social graph, but it, it sounds like maybe a, a bit more work perhaps? Or less because, yeah, so if you can move from one let's say network to another or one experience to another or an algorithm just you know, b- by automated way or by just clicking once that's that actually yeah. um, makes it even 
more smoother. So like I have this concept that I keep talking about. It's called liquid citizen. Um, and I think quite frequently that's in, in Web3, um, the, the kind of uh, peak point of decentralization is that if all these protocols that we're building, uh, whatever they are, like non-financial, social, financial, and if you're in a state where actually you can move from one experience to another and achieve the exact same goal, um, but also let's say you have the technical feature parity uh, in a very simple way, um, you're kind of a liquid citizen in that sense that you can actually choose whatever is aligned with you. So you can choose the communities you want to be part of. Um, it's kind of like a choosing the neighborhood you want to live in by just like clicking a button and teleporting from one place to another and, and boom, you're in a new uh, community and new city and you have new neighbors and new people and, and you're more aligned in, into, into that environment. And I think that's that how it should be because now you really can't do that. So for example, like on Lens, like if you really don't like one of the desktop experiences, like let's say Lenser, which is built by this young kid, an open source um, uh, application, you can go to Lenspeer and Lenspeer is basically giving you the same, but in a different flavor. So I think like in, in the future, like somehow if that user choice is on the user, um, it will change radically. And I think we don't feel it now because we're kind of stuck in the current internet where it's really pretty much owned by the big companies. Um, we have little say, but what we are trying to do is to make it a bit more equitable and taking some of those modes away and giving them as guarantees to the users. And then that means that because those those infrastructural things can't be any more modes, you actually have to think about what are the algorithms that actually benefits the users um, and provides them a lot of value, or what is the experience or the exciting thing in your application that keeps coming them, or what are the actions that the company has to do that actually keeps the customers happy by their own behavior. And that choice is so powerful when it's up to the user. And that makes internet more kind of like a fair and equitable. Yeah. I, yeah, I no, sort of draw, I, th I think that's a great rebuttal. Yeah. I draw the analogy to maybe like podcasting applications or email apps. I don't think anyone complains mm -hmm. that there's too many email clients. And so they don't know which one to use. I think like we benefit, <laughs> yeah. we benefit from a surplus of choice and we can choose one that's, you know, uh, tailored to what our, whatever our needs are, whatever, you know, way that we want to do discovery through or the one with the best spam filtering. And so I think Web3 Social is going to evolve in a similar way where there are lots of options. Those options are ultimately better for the user versus having fewer options. But there's also going to be the power of defaults where, um, yeah, people probably, a few apps m might serve as shelling points. And then it might also, another analogy might be NFT marketplaces where even though all of the assets are on chain and, and sort of anyone can build an NFT marketplace on top, there are other sources of defensibility to them that, that serve as shelling points like, you know, off chain order books or liquidity or interface is another point of differentiation between them. Lee, I'm curious to get your perspective on this as an investor. Um, when you're looking at maybe projects that are building on different ecosystems within Web3 Social, what are sort of the, 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 the metrics that you're looking at and to what extent is token, the big T word, uh, something mm -hmm. that you're interested in? Um, yeah, when it comes to evaluating new social networking applications or platforms, I think we're we're really interested in a lot of the things that I've been, you know, looking for throughout my work as an investor, both in Web2 and Web3. I think a lot of the things that I look for in Web2 social are the same as I look for in Web3 social, which is, are you building an engaging user experience that is significantly differentiated from what has come before? And I think we outlined a lot of ways in which Web3 can offer a very different value proposition than web two social networks. And I would want to see an application really lean into that. Um, and then all of the standard, like sort of consumer social metrics that people tend to use to measure the health of networks are relevant too. like, 
is retention growing over time? That would be a sign of network effects. Are people creating content, not just consuming it? What is the ratio of creation to con- consumption? Um, you know, what is the ratio of daily actives to monthly actives? Is there enough content there to pull people in on a daily basis? Um, so all of those kind of classic consumer application metrics are ones that I would look at. Um, and then I, I feel like there was a second part to the question. And how is uh, how do you sort of think through various um, – if there's a token component? Oh, token. Yeah. I mean, with regards to token, the big T word, as you said, um, like – I mean, what I'll say is like our entire thesis as a firm is around user ownership and crypto enabling ownership to be more widely distributed. Um, And we think that that happens via tokens, which are like packets for sending value and receiving value. And so um, I think we're at kind of this moment of peak token FUD right now, where a lot of builders, a lot of people are in general skeptical. We are. Yeah. But I, I still think that, you know, the theory is sound, which is that when you give users ownership, um, they care more, they're more bought in, they're incentive aligned with a network's growth um, or with a particular creator's growth. I think there's ownership. But it has to be the levels. right time. It has to be at the right time. And I think that implementation details and how to execute this playbook are still TBD and, and being clarified as we speak through experiments that are running right right now and so the specifics of how you introduce a token i think need to be fine-tuned to mitigate a lot of the the adverse effects that it could have like attracting Mm -hmm. speculators and stuff like that but at the end of the day i think giving users ownership i believe that it can make networks grow bigger and faster and be more vibrant and resilient than they would be without having user ownership that's that's my answer fair Um, enough and i i Stani's furiously taking notes. <laughs> Running everything down. <laughs> Go ahead, Stani. <laughs> no, I, I, I really like the um, the first part of the question about what are the different metrics and, and, and whatnot, because I kind of like today I talked to two different audiences. So one audience is the, the Web3 builders. Um, it's been building Web3, um, you know, maybe infrastructure, applications, you know, and, and they're building Web3 social, for example, or some app that has social elements. And then I talk to people who are then the non-Web3 developers, just basically social media founders, you know, and when you start talking about the numbers that Web3 has, you know, they kind of like realize, oh, sounds like it's, you know, these projects are not going anywhere and they're not having product market fit. So like there's two different kinds of realities. And the way I usually like try to also like, approach this challenge is that um, especially with kind of like Web3 social and non-financial applications is that um, we're kind of been building infrastructure uh, until this date in the sense that the same way as for example back in building internet you know in the 90s a lot of infrastructure was was built a lot of these protocols that make it easier actually and accessible to interact online Um, bandwidth started to grow as well uh, what Lee mentioned as well. And then, you know, in the bit early this millennia, what we saw that we started to build the app economy. So we started to build applications on top of existing uh, infrastructures that basically became more usable and consumer uh, friendlier. And the way I explain usually is that we're just kind of like a, in this transition phase where we're going from, we have now infrastructure where we can actually uh, transact on chain with layer twos, for example. Um, and then we have infrastructure like data availability layers that, for example, uh, our lens team, we, we built, uh, Momoka, which is a solution where if you don't want to actually, in, and in most cases, you don't want to tokenize your content to make them, um, an asset on chain, you can use data availability to secure that, that content still exists in the future because, we don't really know what happens if Medium goes out of business tomorrow, what happens to all the internet artifacts that we created or having them on off chain. But the important thing is developer and user uh, choice. And the way I see it is that we have all this infrastructure now and we're slowly, slowly building towards the consumer experience. So one of all of these first applications 
that you see also on lens. You don't sign for gas. You don't sign for transactions. Like you see the blockchain getting abstracted away uh, from you as a, as a user. And I think they are very early applications and, and, and kind of like at some point we will reach more of a, a bigger audiences because we can actually onboard in a way where you don't have to write seeds, uh, 12, 24 words to, to onboard a new user and someone who has like a, enough knowledge of Web3 to actually use some of these interesting experiences and enjoy Web3. So I, I think that's the transition now. Can you can you unpack can you unpack how Lens two brings us further up that adoption curve, and then Lee, maybe you can share what is interesting to you about um, the upgrade. Lens V two is super exciting because what we did with Lens two is that we decided um, to make the com- make the pro- protocol more composable and open. So what we realized mm-hmm. um, during V one. Uh, I mean, we've we've built we've been building Lens for two years now, and this is the third year mm-hmm. uh, that is going. So what we notice is that a lot of the exciting things happens always on a feed, like like a place where people come together and they engage with mm-hmm. content or information. So what we realize is that Lens is actually quite exciting place to distribute content, but also give the users choice how they want to. Uh, engage with the content. So Lens V2 introduces open actions as kind of like the main feature. And what it means is that in Lens, users are um, used to, for example, uh, having actions on content such as commenting, mirroring, uh, which is the reposting, or collecting, basically, if that content is on chain. Um, Open action actually can allow any type of an action directly on, on, on Lens, which means that if you have a creator that is creating content, but they want to use Zora um, as a place to meet NFTs or Manifold or uh, even mirror uh, the, the, the Web3 blogging platform uh, to tokenize, they can actually use that. So the users can actually mint directly on, on those smart contracts. The open action can be as simple as join a DAO or even donate to Gitcoin. Um, it can also be an action such as, for example, you know, buy this NFT or you know, sell this NFT that you have or anything actually. So what it does, it actually makes Lens composable directly on the content with everything that is built uh, on-chain and cross-chain with Oracle. So that's the kind of beauty of it. And the second thing is uh, the profile manager, which means that you can actually start delegating some of the actions to applications. So you can create extremely seamless um, onboarding experience and interaction experience because you can store the profile in a safe place, but the main application that you're using, um, let's say it's Orb or Butterfly, um, you can delegate your social actions directly to those applications. So you don't really see blockchain at all when you're interacting with Lens. And I think that is really, really Cool. Abstraction, more composability, sort of the two key pillars it's there. A bunch of other things, but it's yeah. it's a one hour podcast. So. <laughs> you could do a three hour podcast just on it alone. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe next time I'm in I'm in London. Um, Lee, final word for you. Or final words, please. Don't just say, hi, <laughs> the. Oh my gosh. I need more direction than that. What would, what would you like my final words to be about? Uh, what, no, no, I mean, I guess, you know, if you, if you want to share any thoughts about, you know, what, what you are excited about as it pertains to Lens 2 or just, you know, maybe you could brain drop a prediction for us, actually. Um, what are you, what are you anticipating over the next six months? Mm. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm, that people may not be expecting. I'm going to share a few words on on both of those questions. So on on Lens V2. Okay, great. Um, I think open actions are super interesting. I think composability is mm-hmm. one of those topics that is really overhyped in the short term, but really underrated in the long term. People mm-hmm. talk about it constantly in Web three, and yet on the consumer mm-hmm. application side, like where do we actually see the composability? making a meaningful difference in the user experience. Like they're just, I don't really see it around me. 
And so I think what Lens V2 does is it sort of paves the way for that composability to be really meaningful later on once there are more applications yeah. for users to take advantage of and to be able to take those actions from within the same interface. Um, and then prediction for the future. Well, this was sort of inspired by ETH CC, which I recently attended in Paris. So I co-hosted a social with Lens Protocol mm -hmm. while I was there. And I think the, the broad sentiment among all of the consumer builders who attended this event because it was very consumer builder oriented was that they felt the conference was so infrastructure heavy, but with, like who is building consumer applications to take advantage of this infrastructure and this additional block space. Um, I think there was a sense of like pent up energy for building consumer experiences in web three. And so I'm really excited to see all of those applications coming out. I think in the next year, Fingers crossed, we'll see an application gain a lot of user traction in Web3 because there's so many talented builders that are about to launch right now. And I think it's going to be an application which offers an experience that just is not possible in Web2. Lee. Is that too vague? It sounds like you're hint No, it sounds like what we need is a third conference in Paris for me to attend. Focus exclusively on creators. I need another excuse to spend Actually, two weeks we in Paris. We were talking about doing this next year, so <laughs> you'll be invited. Just we want to we want to host just, it. Just smash it, smash it, smash it right in the middle of of blockchain yeah, Paris week and ECC, so I can literally just stay there from late March to uh, late June. Or, or late July, as it were. Or forever. All and right, guys. We'll do this podcast or, live. or, 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 exactly. I could take the, take a page out of your leaf, uh, your book. Um, well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate you being on the show. Hopefully, you'll be back on again. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks, thank you so much, friend. Thanks, thanks Lee. Thanks.